Hello again. Glad to have you join us as we uh, spend some time kind of catching up on uh, what's going on in and about the church, sharing some of our prayer concerns, and uh, uh, providing you with the weekly sermon. Uh, I did want to address something a couple weeks ago after uh, someone viewed the recorded sermon Sunday morning. They sent me a text and I was a little puzzled. Uh, they commented about the sermon and they liked the comments. They said, but who shoved you with dirty hands? It took me a minute to figure out what they were talking about, and then I realized that day I happened to be wearing this necktie, which my granddaughter has personalized for me. It has her handprints and name signed below, and I happened to be wearing that for that recording. So uh, that would be my six and a half year old granddaughter provided me with that novelty tie uh, that I get to enjoy wearing. As I said, we're glad to have you join us again. There are just a few announcements we want to share. Uh, once again, the church office this week. Teresa will be in the office. Office will be open on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pastor Bill and I are there in and out, uh, in and around those times. So you may catch us there, but you'll know for certain during those top 9 to 2, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, the office, Teresa will be in the office. We want to offer a thank you to... Sarah Miser, Kristen Miser, and Joanne Copeland for providing the music last Sunday evening for our drive-in concert. Uh, and we appreciate their sharing their musical talents. I want to thank uh, Joe Copeland for setting up a stage for us that he brought out. Also, we want to thank Nick Treaker, McCourt, Lowy, and Cliffy Miser for serving up snowballs courtesy of the Ice Shack to those attending the concert. Uh, they also were kind enough to share those uh, on a Sunday morning recently with folks after the service. We want to invite you, if you have a musical talent that you would be willing to share, we are trying to line up special music for our Sunday worship services throughout the fall. If you play an instrument, if you sing, if, if you and a, a loved one would want to do a duet, we are open to uh, inviting you to join us for worship. We are still limited in being able to do congregational singing, so we're welcoming any special music uh, that you might be willing to share with us. Just contact the church office if you'd like to, to offer your gifts in worship. Also a reminder that Pastor Bill and myself are available for pastoral visits. If you are in need of a pastoral visit, we don't automatically know that if you don't let us know, but we're doing what we, offering what we call driveway visits which simply means if you're in need of a pastoral visit, call the office, we'll set up a time and we'll be willing to come out to your home to meet with you. We will safe distance and wear masks and observe uh, safe guidelines, but we want you to know that we are available to uh, share with you and have a time of prayer with you. We want to thank everyone who's helped out by bringing in containers of sanitizing wipes for our teachers. Uh, at last count, we collected nearly 100 of those we gave out some last Sunday evening to some of the teachers who were here at the drive-in concert. And we just want to remind any of the teachers uh, affiliated with our church, if you can make use of these, you can stop by and pick some up or let us know and we'll bring them to you at the school to make them available. We're offering three or four of the canisters to each of our teachers to help them as they begin this new school year. A couple of things we invite you to check on online if you have that ability. Uh, there are some new Sunday school lessons for K through 5 that will be posted online. They are from a uh, production called Orange. They are high quality and they're, we purchased these specifically because if and when we are back in-house we can make use of the material but they also have some options that work well for an online presence. You can check those out by going to our Facebook page or our church website, thoburn.org. Also, starting this next week, I'll be posting some devotionals, though, a few days each week, based on the stories behind some of our favorite hymns. If you happen to have a favorite hymn, and you'd be willing to share why that hymn is significant to you, we'd appreciate you sharing your stories with us. You can do that in an email, or do that in a call, or write us a note, and perhaps we'll be adding some of your hymn stories to those devotional times. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness and show, offer our appreciation for those who have 
continued to support the church so faithfully with their tithes, offerings, and gifts over the recent months. We know that life has been anything for, but normal for most of us. But your faithful stewardship has sustained our ministries. It has helped our church to keep current in our apportionments. Those are our covenant obligations through our annual conference and enabled us to continue and seek new ways of ministering during this time. So thank you for your faithful support. We want to share some items for prayer at this time, some needs that we have. I know you may have some prayer concerns. Again, you are free to email or text or call those in to send us a note, and we will be glad to add your prayer concerns to our prayer list. At this point, we invite you to continue to pray for Richard Jenkins, Richard will be uh, facing a procedure here in the next few weeks. We want to keep him in prayer. For Marjorie Murphy, who's going through chemo, and also for a Julie M., who is facing chemo treatments. For teachers, staff, and families, and students as school begins. I had the privilege uh, yesterday of meeting with some of the teachers and staff at the flagpole of the high school, and we had a prayer for them as they begin this new year. Keep all of these folks in your prayers in this new beginning. Pray for the people of Beirut, Lebanon, people fighting fires in California, those impacted by the flooding and hurricane that recently swept in the Gulf Coast. Uh, this morning I happened to be looking at a small community of Cameron, uh, Louisiana, which is pretty much underwater and has had a huge amount of damage and also around the Lake Charles area. Uh, keep these folks in prayer as they try to piece back the pieces of their lives after this storm. Also in grief, we lift up the family of Elsie Vera Cook. Elsie uh, participated in the life of our church for a number of years, and she went to be with the Lord this past week. So keep her family in prayer. Pray, continue to pray for wisdom and protection for medical personnel, doctors, nurses, and staff for researchers trying to uh, figure out this virus and how they can develop a vaccine and how they can treat those who've already contracted it. Pray for victims of racism. Pray for law enforcement and emergency personnel. Pray for our nation, for healing and a spiritual awakening. For those unemployed and those underemployed, some of us may have been there at some time or another, those struggling to make ends meet, for those battling addiction. Pray for God to open our eyes to how and where he might use us to bring his light to the corners of our dark world. Pray for our leaders locally across our state and nationally. Pray for our United Methodist Church, of which we are part, for our bishops and district superintendents and pastors and congregations. Pray for victims of injustice and oppression. I'd invite you now, if you would, to pause with me for just a moment of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided for each and every one of us for the gift of this new day, for the opportunity to serve and honor you. As we look out upon our world, the problems are many. It gets to be where we almost hate to read the news for what else may have happened that we really don't want to know about. But, Father, we pray that your light would shine through us. We pray for healing for those who are broken. We pray for hope for those who are discouraged. We pray for justice for those who are oppressed. We pray that we might be a people that seek to affirm those things we share in common instead of arguing over those things where we have different views. We pray that we might strive for unity rather than division. And above all, we pray that our hearts and minds, our eyes and ears, might be open and receptive to the leading of your spirit. Hear our prayers in these moments. This morning we're continuing in the sermon series, 
Lessons from the Life of Joseph from the Old Testament uh, book of Genesis uh, from about chapter 39 onward. Uh, last week we looked at Joseph going from uh, being a favored son to being a slave. This morning we'll be looking at Lessons from the Life of Joseph, the fact that even prisoners dream. So I'll begin our reading from Genesis chapter 39. I'll be reading verses 20 to 23, and then I'll bump down to chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Joseph's master, Potiphar, took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Chapter 40. Sometime later, the cupbearer and baker of the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, offended their master. And Pharaoh was angry with these officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in the custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended to them. After they'd been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, each of them had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were distressed. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dream. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Even prisoners dream. The letter I received in the mail had the church's name and address crudely printed out in pencil on the envelope. Include, enclosed in that envelope was a brief one-page letter also printed and written out in pencil it was from a man who was in our county jail. He basically said he was in jail because of some bad choices and that he'd remembered as a child occasionally attending a Methodist church where he grew up. He simply stated that if I had time and opportunity, he'd appreciate it if someone would stop by to see him. My first visit lasted about 45 minutes and he shared bits and pieces of his story with me. As we finished, we had a prayer together. Over the next few weeks, I stopped in and visited with him several times. When he was released from jail, I picked him up, helped him to find a place to live. Folks from our church helped to set him up with the things he needed. He found a job. He began attending our church regularly. Now, one time he moved out of our area and we kind of lost touch for a while and then I learned that the police had picked him up on an old warrant and he'd been taken to Columbus and placed in a prison there. I managed to make a couple trips to visit him in prison. Ultimately a judge reviewing his case released him and I picked him up Together we found a place for him to live in Columbus, he found a job, and he became active in a nearby church. From time to time he'll call me or I'll call him and we'll check up to see how each one's doing. Now here's the kicker. Do you know why he was in jail and then later prison? Well, he admitted he had written a bad check that had bounced. But beyond that, a former business associate who had had some shady dealings, decided to accuse him of having a hand in those shady dealings. I know this to be true because I've seen some of the court records. He wasn't a violent criminal, he wasn't a robber, he wasn't even a thief. 
Even his probation officer, who I grew to know pretty well, confided that this man had no business being in jail. The judge who ultimately released him, apparently looking back through all the files, saw through the accusations and ordered that his file be closed and he be released. A jail or prison can be lonely, even dangerous at times. I'm assuming that's what led this man to reach out and send a letter to a pastor he'd never met before asking for a visit. I still talk with him from time to time. It's been, oh, five, six years since our first encounter. In fact, as I was preparing this sermon, I gave him a call. Shortly thereafter, he called me back, and we spent some time sort of catching up. If you've ever served in a prison or jail ministry, you can affirm that there are great challenges and needs among those who are incarcerated. Some are bitter. Some perpetually deny any responsibility for the crimes that they're accused of committing. Some claim innocence, while others will admit that it's their actions that brought them there. Many are lonely, many are searching for some meaning, some purpose to sustain them and help them to turn their lives around. Some are simply trying to pass their time. Some just want to know that someone cares. As we read from Genesis 39 today, Joseph, an innocent young man, only guilty of aggravating his brothers and rejecting the sexual advances of his master's wife is thrown into prison. And it's not any old county seat jail. This is the prison where Pharaoh, king of all Egypt, sends those who offend him. I suppose you might refer to as the maximum security prison of that day. We're not sure exactly how old Joseph is. We know that he was around 17 when his brothers faked his death and sold him into slavery, we know that by God's plan, he will ultimately enter the service of Pharaoh at age 30. That's told to us in Genesis 41, 46. So he's somewhere between 17 and age 30. He's a young man in prison, probably in his 20s. Joseph could honestly claim that life had been unfair to him. You've heard before he was second from the youngest of 12 children, had been his, father favorite, his father's favorite son, and from early on he was a dreamer. Now I don't mean a pie-in-the-sky daydreamer. No, Joseph was somebody who had vivid, strange dreams that somehow seemed to appoint to events that would occur in the future. Some of them seemed to point that he would rule over his own family, and sharing those dreams didn't win any points of popularity with his siblings. You have to remember that in ancient days, people viewed dreams differently than we do today. Today, if you have a strange or particularly troubling or vivid dream, we tend to blame it on something we ate, or stress, or medication, or something that's been bothering our subconscious. But in ancient times, many believed that dreams were important. A man's dreams might well be a message from the divine foretelling some future event. The more vivid the dream, the more important the hidden message it conveyed. Kings and rulers kept on hand advisors and counselors who on occasion might be called upon to interpret the king's dreams. Joseph's dreams as a young man seemed plain enough to his brothers and father. In one dream, he dreamt that he and his brothers were binding sheaves of grain in the fields, and suddenly Joseph's sheaf of grain stood up tall above all the others, and all of his brother's sheaves gathered round and bowed before it. When he naively shared that dream with his brothers, they saw it as important of things to come that somehow their brother thought he would rule over them. As you may guess, this didn't make them very happy. 
Joseph had another dream where it seemed that the sun, moon, and 11 stars were all bowing down to him. In this instance, even his father took some offense when Joseph shared the dream. What is this dream you had, his father says in Genesis 37, 10? Will your mother and I and your brothers bow down to the ground before you? So when I say Joseph was a dreamer, it refers to the fact that he was receptive to the messages hidden in dreams. First his own, and then later he would come to discern the dreams of others. So as we read earlier, Joseph finds himself in Pharaoh's prison, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. But in verse 21, we're reminded that even when falsely accused, even a slave in a foreign land far from home, even when wrongly imprisoned, the Lord was with him. The Lord showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, you might be tempted to say, if God really cared so much about him and was with him and really wanted to show him kindness, he'd get him out of the stinking prison. But God had a plan. Joseph couldn't see it. Not yet, anyways. Joseph had no idea how all that he'd experienced fit into God's plan and was preparing him. But God had a plan. A plan not just to deliver Joseph, but to save his family and and most of the Egyptian nation. And believe it or not, being sold into slavery, being wrongly imprisoned, were necessary pieces of God's plan. Like a massive jigsaw puzzle, God's plan was coming together. All Joseph could see were the jagged, broken pieces of his life. But God could see how those pieces would come together and fit into his divine will. While in prison, the warden sensed how God was with Joseph and seemed to bless everything he did. So the warden granted him special privilege. We would say he became a trustee. And he was pretty much in charge of running things. God seemed to bless whatever Joseph put his hand to. Potiphar had seen this, and now the prison warden saw this also. It says the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with him and gave him success, whatever he did. And then the Bible says, sometime later, two new prisoners come to the prison. Might have been months, might have been years. These two men had been honor servants, uh, honored servants of Pharaoh, one his chief baker, the other his chief cup bearer. We're not told what their offense was, but they had displeased Pharaoh and he had had him thrown into prison. When they entered the prison, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph's care. Verse 4 and following tells us, after they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men had a dream the same night and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph made his rounds the next day, he sensed the men were troubled, and he asked them why they were distressed. And they said, we both had dreams, but there's no one to interpret them. And then we hear Joseph's words as he says, do not interpretations, revelations, if you will, belong to God. Tell me your dream. And as each man told Joseph their dream from the night before, God gave to Joseph wisdom and insight to interpret their dreams. To the chief cup bearer, Joseph reveals that his dreams foretell that in three days he'd be released from prison and restored to his honored position with Pharaoh. And then after explaining the dream to him, Joseph told the man, when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing deserved to be put in a dungeon. When the man who'd been Pharaoh's chief baker heard the cup bearer's dream foretold such good news, he hurried to tell Joseph about his dream hoping for the same kind of news. 
However, as he told Joseph his dream, Joseph revealed his dream foretold something entirely different. That in three days, the baker would indeed leave the prison, only to be executed. And if you read the later chapters, verses of chapter 40 of Genesis, you'll find Joseph's interpretations played out exactly as he had told them. Three days later, at Pharaoh's order, the baker was executed. Also three days later, the chief cup bearer was restored to Pharaoh's service, just as Joseph had foretold. Only the cup bearer soon forgot about Joseph and failed to speak to Pharaoh about Joseph's release. It would be two long years before he would be reminded of his promise to Joseph that he would speak to Pharaoh. So what can we learn from this ancient story that might benefit our lives today? Well, one, if you're a child of God, then you need to believe or trust that God has a plan and is at work in your life to bring his plan into fruition. Now realize, his plan may not be your plan, but in the long run, you find more purpose, more meaning, more, more fulfillment and joy by submitting to his plan than any plan you might concoct. I read recently of a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln when someone asked him in the coming civil war that was ensuing if he thought God was on his side. He replied, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My concern is to be on God's side. One of the hardest things for some people to accept is that God may have plans for their lives that differ from theirs. Let me tell you, submission and obedience are always part of his plan. The Navigators, a Christian discipling organization, used to print a little evangelistic tract called the Four Spiritual Laws that explained how to, to come to a relationship with Christ. The first spiritual law it listed was this, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Do you believe that to be true? And if so, what are you doing to be open to God's plan? Secondly, God calls us to be faithful in whatever setting or situation we find ourselves. When you don't know what else to do, do this. Remain faithful to God. Sold into slavery, purchased by Potiphar, Joseph showed such faithfulness and integrity that Potiphar put him in charge of all of his holdings. Joseph could have grown bitter. He could have resented his Egyptian master. He could have abused the trust placed in him. But he showed he was a man of integrity and wisdom, and he managed Potiphar's house well. So much so that, as we read last week, with Joseph in charge of everything, the only decision Potiphar had to make was what he was going to eat for dinner each night. Even when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, he resisted. He could have rationalized and said, I'm a slave, they're Egyptians, who will know? But he resisted, and as a result, he's thrown into Pharaoh's prison, where he could have whined and fussed and grown miserable, wasted away, proclaiming his injustice and, and his innocence. But he didn't. He faithfully served the warden and did his best. He modeled integrity and responsibility. Maybe you don't currently find yourself in the job, the relationship, or setting that you dreamed of. Maybe things seem to be pretty unfair as of late. What are you doing about it? Are you faithfully doing your best where you are? Modeling integrity? Honoring the trust that others put in you? giving your very best effort, or are you simply biding your time, offering less than your best, grumbling and complaining about the unfairness of it all? For whatever reason, for whatever purpose, God has you where you are in the situation you are in for a purpose and reason. You may not see it now. 
You probably can't imagine how God could possibly be using this. But trust that he is. Your job, remain faithful. Do your best. Grow where you've been planted. Thirdly, don't allow your preoccupation with your situation to blind you to the needs of those around you. Let me put it another way. Be careful that you don't become so focused, so obsessed with your problem, that you become blind to the cries of others. Verse 6 says, When Joseph came to the chief cupbearer and the chief baker the morning after their dreams, he saw that they were distressed. So he asked them what was wrong. It was through his concern for Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker that a seed would be planted that would lead to Joseph's eventual release from prison. He could have said, you're upset about a dream, let me tell you about my problems. But instead, he saw their need and responded to them. And that seed would be planted. It'd take two long years for that seed to show signs of bearing fruit that God was at work behind the scenes the whole time. C.R. Gibson has written, I have wept in the night at my shortness of sight that to others' needs made me blind. But I never have yet had a twinge of regret for being a little too kind. Remember, there's more to life than just our problems. Try to look beyond your own issues to see where and how you might serve God and the others he brings across your path. Don't be so preoccupied with the problem you're dealing with that you miss the opportunity to bring light and hope to another. Finally, whether he was serving as a slave in Potiphar's household or wrongly imprisoned on false charges, with God at work behind the scenes, get this, Joseph was at exactly the right place at exactly the right time. I think this is more than just coincidence. Can you learn to trust in God's timing and provision? Remember, he's not oblivious to your need or circumstances. We, on the other hand, are often oblivious to his greater plan. Deuteronomy 31.6 conveys to us the concept don't mistake God's patience for his absence. His timing is perfect. His presence is constant. And he's always with us. God had to bring Joseph to the place where Pharaoh would come to rely on him. That's a big job for a young boy from Israel. To do that, God had to connect him with a royal cupbearer. To do that, God had to get him into Pharaoh's prison. To get him there, Joseph had to begin as a slave in Potiphar's house, someone who had access to the royal prison. There's no way Joseph could imagine how all that had happened would come together to work for good and fit into God's plan. Romans 8 reminds us in verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Let me read the same verses from a modern translation known as the Message, translated by Eugene Peterson. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us. 
making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lives as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of all our lives there in him. And God made that decision of what his children should be like. He followed it up by calling people by name. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he'd begun. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition, exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? I want to close for you by reading the words of a song. Uh, it's from a musical penned by Andrew Lloyd Webber called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. If you've never seen it, I challenge you to track it down. It's worth watching. But this is a song written and it's sung by the character portraying Joseph as he is in Pharaoh's prison. It's called Close Every Door to Me. Close every door to me, hide all the world from me, bar all the windows and shut out the light. Do what you want with me, hate me and laugh at me, darken my daytime and torture my night. If my life were important, I would ask, will I live or die? But I know the answers lie far from this world. Close every door to me, keep those I love from me. Children of Israel are never alone. For I know I shall find my own peace of mind, for I have been promised a land of my own. Close every door to me, hide all the world from me, bar all the windows and shut out the light. Just give me a number instead of my name. Forget all about me and let me decay. I do not matter. I'm only one person. Destroy me completely, then throw me away. If my life were important, I would ask, will I live or die? But I know the answers lie far from this world. Close every door to me, keep those I love from me. Children of Israel are never alone. For we know we shall find our own peace of mind. For we have been promised a land of our own. I like that recurring line children of Israel are never alone. As we conclude our message today, we find Joseph still far from home in Pharaoh's prison. His one bit of hope had been that Pharaoh's cupbearer would remember him and do something to help him gain release. But he'll wait two long years, seemingly forgotten in Pharaoh's prison. Even so, we're told, God is with him. And Joseph will continue to serve and trust God. He doesn't give up hope. He doesn't grow despondent in the darkness of prison. He trusts and learns to wait on God. Can we do the same? Next Sunday, we'll look at Genesis chapter 41. From prison to palace, when dreams come true.